told me they went back to cook food because they thought they were missing something or or it was going to help them with their you know with a health problem that they had on raw and i'm going wait a minute wait a minute those were the exact same reasons why you went raw from cooked you went away from cooked for those exact same reasons you know and how could you forget that already but sometimes you just have to let them and we just have to show by example and we have to lead from the front and and that's what leaders do is we lead from the front so tonight i want to talk about three issues that are important to me i, I want to get involved in the chat as well um, and discuss things with you and and make things more clear if i possibly can uh, you know, if you have any questions, always feel free. I mean, this is a living room presentation as far as I'm concerned. And uh, we're all just, we're all at home being comfortable. So um, I'm here to support you and never to pick on you. Uh, I, I want to help you succeed in reaching your health, fitness, performance, eating goals. And, uh, and, and the first question I get tonight is one called, an issue of satiation. Are you satisfied? And, and certainly, there's a lot of sides to the are you satisfied question. Um, I read a I read a blog by a raw fooder. And he said, he said that he ate a cucumber and an apple. And that was it for the whole day. And the next thing I know, everybody's trying to just eat a cucumber and an apple and just eat that for the whole day because, I mean, it, it's inexpensive. It's pretty easy to eat that. Um, but then they couldn't understand why they couldn't do that for months on end or for lifetimes or for years. And, and, I, and I'm like, Yes, there could be a day where you just don't have that much appetite. Maybe you ate a ton the day before. Maybe you've been very sedentary. Maybe you're just overtired. Maybe you've maybe you're emotional. Maybe there's other things going on. Maybe somebody else is in need and you're just too busy. And the only thing you had a chance to, to eat all day was a cucumber and an apple. I mean, it could happen, but that's not that's not something we can go with on a long-term basis. It's something you could do for a week, every day for a week, you could do that, or a month, you could do it even, but you're going to fade away in the process. Um, you're not going to get the protein you need. You're not going to get the calcium you need. You're not going to get the nutrients you need. You're certainly not going to get the calories you need. I don't know how many calories in a cucumber and an apple, 150 maybe, and, and, and we can't defy the laws of thermodynamics. We can't defy the laws of physics. Uh, just, just, I don't know. I don't even remember what your brain takes, but your brain takes a certain number of calories per hour just to keep going seven calories an hour or something. I don't remember what it takes, but your brain takes some calories every hour. And, um, you know, you, that's not even an apple and a cucumber. That's not even enough to keep your brain going, let alone to keep your heart pumping blood to your brain or, or your muscles for breathing or to keep your kidneys kidding. So um, we got to find something that's sustainable. And one of the, one of the guidelines that to me is crazy important, uh, which could be several hours worth of presentation if we want, but tonight we'll just open up the door. And, and that's this issue of satiation, of being satisfied. How long are you supposed to be satisfied? When are you supposed to be satisfied? Uh, how do we recognize it? You know, what does it mean? Well, I mean, if we can go back in time to before we'd ever heard of raw food as a concept, you know, as a, as a dietary choice, to the ignorance is bliss times when, when we didn't even know such options existed satiation meant that you could eat a meal and you'd be satisfied until the next meal. The question that you're usually asked if you're at a guest's house is uh, two questions. Do you like the food? Did you get enough? Well, if you liked it, that's, that's 
a different kind of satisfying to like your food. But did you get enough is a critical kind of satisfying because if you didn't get enough, and I'm sure you've all had this happen where people have come to your house to eat something, you made them something that they weren't all that impressed with. And, and you knew for sure that when they left your house, they went somewhere else to eat. You know, they quick went to a fast food place or something to get some food and, uh, and that you hadn't actually done the job. You hadn't satisfied them. They weren't satiated. And it's usually that they're not satiated because they didn't eat much. They didn't eat enough. Uh, food has to be pretty good for you to eat enough to where you're satiated, willing to be satiated. We have a lot of freedom in the world, right? Like you, we won't eat. If somebody said dirt was good for you, you know, you just won't eat dirt um, or tree barks and, and flip flops. Um, you could fill up on tree bark and flip flops, but it wouldn't be very satiating. You probably stop eating it pretty early on in the game. Um, and you wouldn't get the nutrients. So satiation comes from so many levels because we're not, we can sort of fool the body. Have you ever tried to satiate yourself on water? You ever try to fill up on water? I've seen people try to do it. I tried to do it uh, where you just like, okay, well, let me just drink more water. Oh, I'm thirsty. I'm going to drink more. I'm hungry. I'm going to drink water. You know, well, it does. You can fill your tummy with water and, and feel full for a couple of seconds or maybe even a couple of minutes, but then the tummy's empty again. And, and so the satiation only lasted for moments and it really wasn't even satiation it was just filling well filling the tummy is certainly part of the issue um, i don't know the exact year but at some point in the space program the the astronauts made it perfectly clear that although nasa had figured out how to make supplementation possible out in space. There's a problem eating food out in space, right? Because the computers were pretty uh, primitive. The, the mechanisms were very sensitive. And all you had to do was spill a Coca-Cola once and, and it would, in zero gravity, just go everywhere and create havoc and nobody would be able to come home. So, uh, they hadn't yet figured out how to package food into these little containers that were easy to eat without opening the package. And, and instead they, they super concentrated the food down to basically, they removed the fiber, they removed the water. Um, and, and, and all of a sudden you had these basically some tablets of food and wasn't much volume at all. And the athletes are, I mean, the astronauts are going, this might be good, but, and it might be everything we need in this little tablet, but it's not satisfying. I want to eat 10 of them because I need more volume. And, and I, but they all give me all the calories I need. And I don't need 10 times as many calories. I'm up here in zero gravity. I, I don't need that many calories, but I need the volume in order to be satisfied. So it's kind of an obvious realization when you make it or when you have it that nature set us up to eat certain foods and one of the way that nature drives us towards eating those foods is because they provide enough volume to leave us satisfied after we eat them and so when people aren't used to eating volume like you say you've been eating cooked food for 50 years and now you decide to eat raw food. Well, cooked food is a lot less volume. A lot of the water is driven off. A lot of the fiber is removed. Uh, or if it wasn't vegan, it didn't have any fiber at all. Um, and, you, and you end up eating food that, that's very concentrated food. So I know uh, one of the comments you may have heard me make before is I look at a happy meal, what they call a happy meal. And I go, that's not very happy. That's a tiny little meal, man. That's, that's only a few bites and it's over. How could you be happy after such a thing? I mean, maybe three or four happy meals might be enough volume to satisfy me, but 
but then the calorie load would be four or five times too much. And, and so you end up not happy for that reason. Uh, it, we're not looking to just eat fiber. Uh, you know, we don't want just volume with no calories. That won't work either. Uh, we don't want calories with no volume. We, once again, we're looking at this kind of a Goldilocks, get it just right within normal limits. So nature provides us with a huge array of, of calorie per volume options. Uh, when we eat vegetables, typically lettuce, celery, cucumbers, uh, we're typically eating incredibly high volume, incredibly low calories per bite. Uh, it, it would be impossible. I'll say it would be impossible to get all the calories you need just from eating iceberg lettuce or even romaine lettuce, which has twice the calories per bite of iceberg. It would still be not only impossible, but if somehow somebody could manage in one day to eat actually not juice, but eat all the calories they need just from lettuce, they couldn't do it again the next day because they couldn't bear to look at lettuce the next day. It would just be an impossibility. So, so eating just lettuce, eating just celery, this isn't, this isn't a possible option for us. And we, we have to turn to the next food source, which is fruit. Now, fruit carries more calories per bite than vegetables. Anywhere from, from 2 to 20, give or take, from 2 to 20 calories, uh, tw 2 to 20 times the caloric density of what vegetables offer. There's an interesting guy, Richard Leakey, um, from the famous Leakey family of anthropologists. And, and he wrote a book, I think it was called The Origins of Humankind. And in his book, he, he didn't come up with any theories per se that he wanted to tout in the book, but more what he did was give his views on what all the other people had to say, what the other professionals in his field had to say and, and explain those taking what he considered to be the best of each of them and presenting it to everybody. Uh, in any case, his, they, they got to the question about how did humans get to become humans, you know, because there were at least seven or eight other human like, species before we got to homo sapiens and and how did we get to this point where instead of having a small brain we got a big brain and da, 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 da. and the and the consensus at the moment no matter what you read uh because people take spin on everything but what the what the scientists actually had to say was that their theory is that we, we had the capability to grow bigger brains, but we didn't have access to the calories required to fully develop ourselves. Now, I'll give you an example of that, which I may have touched on once before, which is called key deer. And, and the key deer live down in the Florida Keys and they are white-tailed deer like you find up and down the entire east coast of the United States. Now, a big deer is quite an impressive thing. And, and a key deer is cute. It's a miniature deer. It's the size of a roughly, the, it's smaller than a Great Dane, roughly around the size of a German Shepherd or a little bit bigger. But smaller than a Great Dane. And it's a deer. So it's really fragile and really light. And, and key deer, they're very cute, but tiny. And only a few years ago did scientists discover that the key deer of the Florida Keys are actually 
the same species of white-tailed deer as you find everywhere else in the East Coast of the United States. It's just that they had been without sufficient calories for so long that they adapted down in size. And the smallest survived, and then the smallest survived, and then the smallest, and they had smaller and smaller offspring until now we have an entire, it's still the same species, white-tailed deer. Well, they said the same thing about the human brain, only in reverse, that because we didn't have access to calories, we couldn't grow into the people that we were capable of becoming. And when we changed over to a more dense calorie source, and that's all the scientists said, this is all the anthropologists theorized, when we came to eating a more dense calorie source, nobody said, oh, we started eating meat. Well, nobody said that. People have interpreted it that way, but then nobody said that. In fact, they tell us that if they look at the teeth of those ancient peoples, they ate fruits and vegetables, which I find fascinating because you'll hear how we got big brains from cooking food, <clears throat> which... I'm not seeing today, that doesn't really make sense because if that was the case, then how come our brains aren't getting bigger and bigger and bigger as more and more and more of our diet is made of cooked food? I mean, there's people who eat cooked food at every meal of the day, every day of the year. Uh, there's people who almost never ever eat any fruits and vegetables at all, almost never ever. It just doesn't make sense that eating something that we know is harmful to us made us smarter. I mean, there's, there's nothing about this concept that, that makes sense. And, and then there's other people who said, well, no, you know, it really wasn't eating cooked food. It was eating meat that made us smart and made our brains get bigger as a result. And I'm going, well, once again, meat wasn't, meat wasn't particularly plentiful in the human diet until we harnessed the internal combustion engine and started started using tractors to plow fields this is when farmers went from four cows in their herd to 400 and 4000 and 40000 and and the high fat diet that accompanied that and the high meat diet that accompanied that really wasn't implemented until late 1800s early 1900s so since this huge brain jump happened whenever it did 800,000 years ago or something, uh, it was certainly before access to, to large, large quantities of meat. It, it doesn't make any sense that meat eating made you smarter. Once again, um, the smart ones among us can easily see that if you have half a brain, you'd be eating fruits and vegetables, not meat because it's more supportive to your overall health and development. So we have to look at the satiation thing and say, well, what the heck then was more calorie dense that supported this brain development? And the answer is fruit. Fruit supported brain development because fruit, for a man living in the woods, or a woman living in the woods, the most readily available food is leaves. I mean, leaves are everywhere. Fruit, you kind of have to bump into it here and there as you can. You have to remember when the fruit, you know, you have to remember when that tree gave you ripe fruit and which fruits made you sick and which ones made you feel good and da 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 da. You might even have to fend off some other creatures. So, but fruit can easily give you 5, 10, 15, 20 times the caloric density. I mean, you can eat one durian and get 1,500 calories. Do you know how many leaves you'd have to eat to get 1,500 calories? I mean, it would just take you a long, long, it'd be, 
I mean, it would be 30 heads of iceberg. <clears throat> I just can't. Oh, man. Who's going to eat 30 heads of iceberg? If I give you the option. Okay, you can have 30 heads of iceberg or you can have one durian. Uh, thanks. I'll take the durian. 30 heads of iceberg is going to take me a week. And uh, it could take me a month. <sighs> so the increased caloric density that we accessed in order to become smarter people, at least so goes the theory, could just as easily have been because we switched over to a fruit-based diet from a leaf-based diet. And, and all of a sudden we had the available caloric density to do further brain development, to reach our fuller potential, to grow as individuals, to become taller, uh, and just become a little bit bigger. So all those things are good. I'm okay with all that. I don't, I'm not espousing a theory. I'm just saying, this is what the scientists have told us, uh, what they've speculated. Nobody speculated in that whole group that it was fruit. It took a different scientist, the lady by the name of Clark. I wanna say Helen, but don't quote me on that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, <coughs> breathe and think and talk all at the same time, huh? So, anyway, she's a biologist, and Dr. Clark is a biologist, and she theorized one of two things, and she said, I don't really know which it is. She said, either humans became smarter. And as a result of becoming smarter, we started eating more fruit and fewer or less leaves. Or humans started becoming smarter as a result of choosing fruit over leaves. And the resulting increased caloric density and decision-making required. Because I mean, you know, when you're in the jungle and there's a bunch of leaves, you just grab a leaf and eat it. But when you're in the jungle and you gotta remember where was that fruit tree? When was it in season? What are the predators that I'm gonna have to fight off? Do I have to get there early and, and eat the fruit before it's ready? Um, all the decision making that is involved in eating fruit compared to eating leaves, lots of decisions. Is it ripe? It, da, da, da. That making all those decisions triggered the development of intelligence, if you will. So, and there's still people saying that to this very day that it's. It's the very act of making decisions that helps trigger intellect. Well, we're back at satiation, satiation levels and talking about satiation. Pretty much everybody that ever ate cooked food figured out how much food to eat. But now when we're eating different food, we have to learn over again and we're going to learn from experience basically we're going to under eat until we eat enough because it seems like enough we're used to eating small quantities of food that have high caloric ratios and all of a sudden we're eating bigger quantities of food and taking in fewer calories and people are happy at first usually if they've got a few pounds to lose great if they've got pounds to gain, it's like, oh my gosh, how do I do this? Well, you're going to have to learn to eat more. It, it, it takes a little bit of, it takes a bit of practice. It takes practice because mentally it's hard to imagine eating that much food. Um, mentally or physically, you look at the plate full of food and go, oh, that, that just looks like too much. We don't have a framework of reference of how much 
Okay, what's for dinner? Blueberries. How many are you going to eat? Three blueberries. Well, now three blueberries isn't going to do it. I'm going to need more than that. Maybe three pints of blueberries. Well, I don't know how many calories in a pint of blueberries, but it's not very many. If dinner's supposed to be a thousand calories for me or 700 for some somebody, you know, but even 700 calories worth of blueberries is a lot of blueberries. It's more than you think it is. It's a lot of blueberries. And you're gonna to have to chew them pretty well too, or they'll pass through without being digested at all because the skins are tough. And we do not have the digestive enzymes to break down fiber on the skin of a blueberry. So the satiation issue becomes both a short-term and a long-term one. Um, eating until satisfied. I know how many slices of pizza it would take to satiate me until the next meal, whether I have four hours until the next meal, or if I have seven hours until the next meal, and I'll eat accordingly. But if it's, if it's blueberries or apples or peaches or mangoes, we've got to learn a bit, or else you find out, wow, three hours later, and I'm so hungry, this raw food thing isn't working. Well, actually you didn't work it exactly correctly. You could have worked it better. And so satiation ties in with volume that we have to get used to eating a bit more volume, not more volume than we should, more volume than we're used to because we got used to eating tiny bits of quantities of food because it was so calorically dense food with the fiber removed is is you know it, it's just very small on the plate you know it's uh fiberless food doesn't doesn't add up to much and it packs a huge caloric density so now we have to make up for that and and this takes some practice to learn to eat sufficient volume to make peace with it that that the volume has to go into our stomach and pass through our intestines. And in a way you could make up for it and go, yes, but on a standard Western diet, the average person, just average, um, the food coming out is coming out three days after it went in, which means that the average person has nine, 10, 11, 12 meals in their gut at any given time. Granted, each of those meals is smaller, whereas on a raw food diet, the meal's coming out maybe 18 hours late after you ate it. But So there's only two of them in there, but they're bigger meals. It's what our system's designed for. We're, the digestive system is designed to be processing food. It's not something we really go, oh, well, I don't want to have food in there. Yeah, well, yeah, you do. That's what it's for. That's what that part of your body's made for. And, and it's made to handle a pretty darn good volume of food. We're not supposed to eat till we hurt. We're not supposed to eat until we knock ourselves out, fall asleep. Uh, we're not supposed to eat until we have digestive distress or digestive inefficiency. Um, but we do have to eat enough. And if you don't eat enough, you will crave, you will not be satisfied, you will be told in, in no uncertain terms because you're going to start looking around for something to eat. And it's just that simple. You start looking around for something to eat. And by the time that happens, you got to go, hmm, I didn't eat enough fruit at the last meal to hold me until the next meal. And it's that straightforward, whether you're looking around for something sweet or whether you're looking around for something rich or whether you're looking around for something starchy or whether you're looking around for another dessert. It, it really, if you're looking, if you're going, wow, I wonder, I wonder what else I could eat. You didn't eat enough fruit at the beginning of the meal. The fruit portion has to come first. You could save it to last, 
like most Americans do, right? They eat their whole meal, then they have dessert. They eat until they can't eat any more at all, and then they have dessert. And they don't end up with massive digestive distress as a general rule, because much of what they eat is inert. It's not chemically active food, but when we eat fruits and vegetables, we're eating biologically, chemically active ingredients. If you've ever looked on a label of things where it says active ingredients and inert ingredients, there's no, in the, no inert parts to the food we eat. It's all active, which means that, that the, the bacteria and the microbes in our gut process all of our food completely process our food and they look at all of it as food. So with, with all of that activity, if we don't eat in a way that supports the speed with which food goes through our system, you can end up creating um, a bit of a a little bomb in your stomach, right? And you end up with a gas bomb. Uh, nobody particularly wants that. We, you can end up with indigestion, with wind, with uh, just the problems that you don't want to have. Whereas, so fruit goes through your system faster than vegetables. If we eat the fruit first, two things happen. Not only does it get the head start, so whatever you eat afterwards is never going to catch up. You don't have to worry about that problem anymore. But also the sugars in the fruit, the glucose and the fructose in the fruit require no digestion in order to be absorbed into the bloodstream. Now, a rise in blood sugar or a rise in blood glucose that accompanies the consumption of fruit is monitored in your brain. Blood glucose levels are constantly being monitored. And when blood glucose levels rise as a result of eating fruit, a message is triggered from the brain to tell us, for us to sense satisfaction. Now, people who've been trained to eat dessert last try the raw food diet and they have a piece of fruit or two and they go, I'm full. You go, that's never going to work. You can't have a piece of fruit or two and be full. Uh, that You got to eat a whole meal. And they go, no, 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 I'm full. Because they've been so trained by food that was not satiating it didn't have the glucose. It didn't have the volume. They eat a whole meal of that. And then the only thing that lets them know that they're satisfied is a little bit of dessert. Because with that little bit of dessert comes the rise in blood sugar that they associate with satisfaction, with satiation. Ah, now I'm okay. Had my tea and cookie, you know, had my coffee and cake, whatever it was. So we go on raw food and we go, oh, we got a problem here. You know, I eat, I eat one mango and I go, man, how could I, I couldn't eat another mango? I'm just so, I mean, I'm, I'm so satisfied. Yeah, you're satisfied for 45 minutes. That's, we need to learn through practice, through trial and error to eat enough food to be satisfied as long as you hope to be satisfied. If it's, if, it's, if it's lunch at 11 in the morning and dinner's not gonna be till seven at night, it's gonna be a big lunch for me. If it's lunch at one in the afternoon and dinner's at five, I'm eating a substantially smaller lunch. It takes practice to be able to do that. Granted, it takes practice. You've got the rest of your life to figure it out. I understand kids take 10 years between ages, whatever, two or three to, to till they become teenagers 
And they figure it out then. And the kids that are raised on raw pretty much figured it out so that they can do breakfast, lunch, and dinner, maybe a fourth meal if they want, if they're super athletic and, and, and they eat three, four times a day and they're totally satisfied and they've figured it out by the time they're teenagers. We might be able to figure it out quicker, maybe, but it might take us longer because we've got so much to overcome in the way we were trained about our thoughts with food that it might actually be harder for us. So give yourself some time. Uh, I say seven to 10 years. Give yourself seven to 10 years to figure this out to where you get really, really comfortable, happy, where you're very rarely erring and you just go, ah, I got it right. Meal after meal after meal. I just get it right every single time. I'm not even thinking about it anymore. I just eat raw food because that's how it is. And it just works. And so I just keep working it and it keeps working and I keep working it. And it, you know, in seven to 10 years, that only gives you like half a dozen or seven or eight chances at Christmas dinner with your family. Like you want that to go well or Easter, Easter Sunday with your family, you know, or, or, or eating at a conference, a business conference, or I don't know what, you know, what opportunities challenge you the most, but some of them, you don't get very many chances to practice even in seven to 10 years until you can figure this out and make it go just as smooth. And it goes just as right as any other time of year, any other meal, any other day. So hopefully you can go, wow, that's a relief. It's only been three years or it's only been five, you know, like I've got time to figure this out. My estimate, seven to 10 years, that's if you're really trying. If you're not really trying all that hard, it could take longer. Okay, it could take longer. Depends on who's guiding you. One other issue, and this issue is, is admittedly highly controversial. I don't understand why it's controversial. I don't find it to be controversial in my mind. Maybe some of it's because the chemistry is difficult to fully understand. If you wish to preserve something, the idea, the way to preserve things is to stop bacteria from acting upon it. And so if you get a cut, you can put honey on the cut and bacteria can't get through the honey and get into the wound. But if you want to preserve meat or fish, honey won't do the job. The way that's typically done is with salt. If you salt fish or you salt meat, you can preserve it so that microbes can't attack it, won't attack it. They can't get through the salt. Why? Because the salt is deadly to them. In many parts of the world, salt is the, is the chosen method of suicide. Uh, if you eat two ounces of salt, you will die if you're used to eating salt. If you're not so used to eating salt, less than an ounce will be enough to kill you. Uh, I don't know when the last time was you had salt, but uh, if you haven't been using much or any salt for a while, less than an ounce, which is about an ounce is about 28 grams. Um, the average person in America is eating 15 grams of salt every day. So they're eating half the deadly dose every day, but their body can process that much or close to that much. And so it doesn't kill them, but it can't process much more than that. It will kill them. But along the way, it leaves you highly dehydrated. 
you may have heard advertisements or doctors or other people saying that we're supposed to drink eight to 12 glasses of water a day. What they don't say is your diet is so dehydrating because of the salt and other foods that don't contain the water that we naturally need. Your diet is eight to 10, eight to 12 glasses of water deficient. Change to a diet that isn't water deficient and you won't have to drink any water at all or very little, even in warm climates, unless you're really going out in the sun and just sweating it out. So I grew up on the beach in New Jersey and our family had a very tiny boat. We used to go water ski behind it and things like that. And, and I learned a lot of things about the sea. One of the things I learned is that when fishermen or other people out, in, out at sea get stranded out at sea, boat sinks and they're out in a life raft or something, after a few days, you get very thirsty. The phrase, water, water everywhere and not a drop to drink is what, that's all, what that experience is all about. People out in a lifeboat were told not to drink the seawater. Why not? Because the seawater contains a bit of salt and the salt requires so much water to keep it appropriately diluted in our body it requires more water than seawater offers. Hence, when you drink seawater, you get thirstier because you're becoming dehydrated and you eventually die of dehydration from drinking seawater. Essentially the same thing that happens to you if you drink urine, it dehydrates you and you would die of dehydration. So I found it interesting that people would dehydrate themselves intentionally. In the world of sports physiology, which is the physiology that I most trust because the results can be repeated by anyone any scientist, any athlete, uh, they can repeat what was found in sports physiology. It's, it's, it's a little cleaner than some other sciences where the results aren't always reputable or repeatable. And in sports physiology, they tell us that if we become 1% dehydrated, meaning 1% of your body weight. So if you're a hundred pound lady and you lose one pint of water, a pint weighs a pound. So that would be 1% of your total body weight. If you're one pint low on water, we can measure performance decline, physical performance, mental performance. We can measure performance decline at 1% dehydration. At two and three and 4%, this performance declines get worse and worse and worse. Somewhere around 5%, the average person becomes a candidate for hospitalization. And so, for instance, at big road races and, and big races like the Hawaii Ironman, they weigh you before you start. They weigh you several times during the course of the event because it's very hot, high exertion. And, and if you lose 5% of your body weight during the course of the event, you are removed from the race because you're, you go much lower than 5% and you're going to be a, or, or much more than 5% loss, and you're going to be a candidate for hospitalization. They're doing it for your own safety. So lo and behold, next thing I hear is people are recommending that we dehydrate ourselves in the name of health, that getting dehydrated is a health practice, which is craziness. It absolutely doesn't fly. 
and and they go well not only the we're designed to eat and we're designed to stay hydrated so the way to get healthy is to stop eating and stop drinking and this does not make sense dehydrating yourself um, can only lead to worse and eventually deadly problems if in fact what was called dry fasting actually was a health practice, then we could speed it up and make it an even healthier practice by telling those people who are dry fasting that they're actually allowed to eat things. The first thing we'd want them to eat, of course, would be to eat salt because that would dehydrate them even more quickly. But eating, I mean, just drinking seawater makes most people vomit uh, and it certainly dehydrates you. Can you imagine? taking the water out of seawater and then just consuming the salt? Well, in a dry fasting situation, this would be, this would be rapid, rapid fire, deadly. It would not take very long at all before we started seeing deaths. I find it fascinating that to the rest of the world, while they're eating their food, that they intentionally take the water out of seawater and then consume the salt that's left and add it to their food. This is not a health practice. Salt is not good for anybody ever. Could there be a situation where, I don't know, one in the billion where, where salt would be really needed? Yeah, okay. I understand there could be some life and death medical issue where people become, you know, desalinated, but I can't, I've never run across it. I've never run across it. This is not a common situation. People don't go low on salt. They don't go low on sodium. Uh, as a general rule, they don't go low on sodium. They do go low on sodium in fasting situations, but that low is considered normal for fasting. Fine. Uh, not so low that it becomes dangerous, deadly, or affects motor performance. Like what we see, if you look at an Ironman performer who's gone into some kind of an electrolyte problem and they're staggering down the road and falling, um, you know, from low sodium, we're not seeing that in fast. So we certainly don't see this when we're talking about eating a raw food diet. When we're eating a raw food diet, where we're eating fruits and vegetables, we're getting plenty of sodium. Uh, we're getting not too much, not too little. And all of the right things happen as a result. Adding salt to our food is absolutely unnecessary. It's like when people ask me, you know, about the various, what they call raw sweeteners that are available. And I go, what are you going to put it on? I mean, you're already eating fruit. You don't really need to sweeten it. And the same thing for, for salt. We should, if you ever find yourself in a situation where you're craving, so this is our, now our fourth, our fifth, rather, our fifth potential craving is a craving for salt. And some people every once in a while say, oh yeah, I found myself really craving salt or salty food. If you ever find yourself in a situation where you're craving salt, it's let it be a warning, like a like a giant sign and, and a flashing red light going on. You haven't been eating enough vegetables. Eat more vegetables, your salt cravings will go away. Eat more fruit, all other cravings will go away. You can be satiated from meal to meal eating sufficient volume to hold your weight and by all means, hold the salt. Just pass on that completely. That's it for today. Uh, if anybody has questions, I'm happy to handle them. Thank you, Dr. Graham. Wow, it was amazing. Pleasure. I like the salt analogies and yes, we're all guilty of salt, but now we have an absolutely different understanding what we're doing to ourselves by salting the food. So, 
Well, anybody questions? I think there's oh, yeah, I see some here. Yeah. Um, what do I think is a normal volume of food? I think a normal volume of food is enough volume of food so that you can hold your weight if the if you're the weight you want to be, and and if you need to gain weight, then it's a tiny bit more at each meal. And if you're needing to lose weight, then it's a tiny bit less at each meal. 120 calories. Thank you, Brian. And a pint of blueberries. So how many pints could you imagine how many pints you'd have to eat to get your 3000 calories a day? You got, I mean, that's a lot of pints of blueberries, right? That's like 26 pints of blueberries or 27 pints of blueberries. You got to eat some blueberries. Um, why do I think people started eating meat? I think before there were grocery stores, food was sometimes very scarce. I think food was sometimes very scarce. I think there were times where you would try anything to find out if it was food. Uh, you would nibble the bark off of trees to find out if it was food. You'd bite into practically every leaf in the jungle to find out if which ones are edible. I mean, I, I, I admitted surprise the first time somebody told me they could eat hibiscus leaves. I mean, I'd been living around hibiscus plants for a long, long time. Nobody had ever told me they were perfect, that the leaves were better than spinach and, and way more plentiful. So certainly better than than tropical spinach, which is very, has a lot of mucilage in it. So um, I think they started eating it partly out of need to eat something. Uh, if you've watched, if you've ever seen the films of the, of the chimpanzees eating the squirrel monkeys, they, they chase the red squirrel monkeys out of the trees. Um, Sorry, this, is, this takes a moment to build. Uh, in the jungle, food is sometimes very plentiful and sometimes not so much. And this is not only seasonal, but annual cycles as well, where five years in a row or 10 years in a row, there can be a whole lot of food and then not so much for a few years. Well, when there's lots of food, always, always, anytime there's lots of food, you create a population explosion for whatever eats that food. And then, so now there's more chimpanzees and there's more squirrel monkeys because they're eating the same food. And then all of a sudden there's not so much food for a couple of years and there's lots of squirrel monkeys and lots of chimpanzees and not much food. All of a sudden the, uh, although the chimps are the, are the primary, you know, they're the main predator there. The, they never bothered a squirrel monkey ever as long as there was plenty of fruit and veg to eat. But now there's not so much and they still don't bother the squirrel monkeys, but the squirrel monkeys are hungry too. And they start impinging more and more. They start encroaching onto what the chimpanzees consider to be their territory, their food, their terrain. And the chimps make it clear that they don't like that but the squirrel monkeys are hungry. And eventually the chimps with a little bit of conversation amongst themselves go, okay, we need to set an example here. And they will track down a couple of squirrel monkeys that venture too far into the chimpanzee turf and they will literally rip them apart and eat them. And this sends a powerful message to the other squirrel monkeys don't mess with the chimpanzees. Don't mess with their food. If they say, get out of here, you get out of here. Uh, <clears throat> did humans do the same thing? I don't know. I honestly don't know, but maybe we just got to a point where we weren't, we weren't tolerant of whoever it was eating our food. And we started going, you know what? Let's just eat them. It, how did we ever get to eating meat? I can't even imagine. I, I've got to make up stories as if they were real. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. How did we ever get to? <laughs> we're going to talk a bunch more about cravings next week. We're going to, oh no, that's the 12th. What happens on the 5th? We'll skip, we'll skip a weekend. <laughs> yeah. 
make some plans for next weekend and we will see you on December 12th um, with Food 101. Karen, that's it. Yep. And Karen, that's a great question. How does exercise fit in? I mean, that's a, that's a super question. Um, exercise really is, a, is like throwing a monkey wrench into the works because the more you exercise, the hungrier you get, which in some ways is a beautiful thing. But in some ways, if you're having a hard time eating enough, uh, you know, it's, it's tricky. The, the beautiful thing about fruits and vegetables is that you have so many options to, to play with. I, I've, I've worked with some interns who were with me for months at a time and, and they would, they really got into the idea of eating bananas for lunch every single day. Okay, I'm just eating bananas for lunch, bananas for lunch, bananas for lunch. Just made peace with it. That became their staple food for lunch. No thought required. But they weren't doing much exercise. And the next thing they know, they were starting to gain weight. And they come to me and they go, how come I'm gaining weight? I'm going, well, you're eating like, you're eating bananas for lunch every single day. That's, that's, that's pretty serious calorie dense food compared to if you ate peaches for lunch every day, or if you ate apples for lunch, or if you ate melon for lunch, uh, or oranges for lunch. I mean, you, it would be almost impossible to eat as many oranges in terms of calories as you do bananas. So we would have them switch to something that wasn't so calorically dense and the, and the calories drop right off drop right off because they're filling up with the volume until they've had enough but it just wasn't the same calorie base now yes for sure if you're at all in tune with yourself you will notice that when you're exercising more you want to eat more and when you're exercising less you do want less food but when you're used to eating more food even if you want less it's a little bit challenging to actually eat less because <laughs> you're used to eating more. And that, and there can be, so there's going to be like these give and take things going on where you have to find the balance. Yes, you could very likely. I mean, it's what happens to guys, you know, they've been athletes for 20 years, 30 years, and then they retire and then they get fat because they're used to eating like athletes and, it, and on, on standard Western fare, you, you just can't, you can't find a happy balance. It's a rare person who can find a happy balance between eating so little volume while still taking in, you know, just basically you're taking in enough calories, but it's so little volume or else you're taking in enough volume, but it's way too many calories. So, and it's hard to find that balance place on a standard Western fair because it's so, it's so calorically loaded. At least with our food, we've got a better chance. But I notice for sure um, in my sport, uh, I'm lifting currently as, a, as my sport of choice. And, um, and I do two different kinds of lifting in terms of the workouts. Some workouts, I'm practicing my technique. I'm putting in a bit of volume. I'm really trying to get the form just right. I'm not lifting super, super heavy, but I'm trying to get it, trying to get it as exact as I can. Uh, and then there's other days where I lift very, very heavy. And after I lift heavy the next day, I am just so hungry. <laughs> just so hungry. I say, like, oh yeah. Definitely. If you do, you go out and swing a pitchfork for four hours and, and really do some serious work, you will get hungry. But it can be, I guess the best example I can give you is that these things take time. Um, when I run a health and fitness week, which is a program I run every year out in Cedar Woolley, Washington, and I run health and fitness week, and I warn the chef, whoever the chef is, look, this is what's going to happen. You're going to serve your normal 3,300 calories per person on the first day. And there'll be food left over. But the next day I want you to serve 3,500 calories. 
and there'll be food left over. And the next day serve 3,700 calories and there won't be food left over. And the next day serve 3,900 and there won't be food left over. And the next day serve 4,100 and there won't be enough food. And it's like clockwork because they're exercising. People are exercising a lot at Health and Fitness Week by choice. And it's not super high intensity, but there's a lot of duration. And we do a two hour class before breakfast, before lunch and before dinner. It's a lot of play. And in six hours, the first day, you're not all that hungry. But by the second or third, you start realizing you really are hungry. By the seventh day, you just, you almost can't eat enough. You start losing weight. It takes, it takes, and this one, I'll tell people, you know, like if I'm, if I'm being sedentary and I'm eating 3000 calories a day, but when I'm being super active, I'm easily eating 4,000 4, a day. And sometimes 4,500 if I'm, if I'm that active. Yeah, but so it's a great question. Exercise, exercise fits in um, not only with satiation, but it also fits in with your nutrition because if you're completely sedentary, you're not eating much, which means you're not taking in much in the way of nutrients either. So if you want to increase your nutrient intake, increase your activity levels in order to upgrade your calorie intake and along with it will come improved nutrition that's about it 